All right. We are ready to talk about Chapter 7. Chapter 7 is the skeleton. This becomes a point in lecture when there's only so much I can do. Okay? I took my jacket off where I can move around a little better and I can point to different parts of my body and we can talk about bones. But a lot of this is you have to study the pictures and you have to learn where the bones are located. What I'm going to do is try to present it to you in an organized manner and give you some little tips on the easiest way to learn the locations and the different parts of some of the bones. Okay? Now, as we start Chapter 7, again, we're going to separate it into axial and appendicular. We're going to start with axial, which is made up of just the skull, the vertebrae, and the rib cage. Now, that seems like that's not that much. That should be easy. The axial is the hard part. The axial is over 80 bones in just the skull, the rib cage, and the vertebrae. Okay? In my opinion, the skull, which is made up of the cranial bones and the facial bones, are the hardest part because all of the bones of the skull are permanently fused together. There are no movable joints in the skull. So when you just look at the skull, it looks like one big bone, but it's not. It's made up of a bunch of really tiny bones permanently fused together. So what we're going to start with is the skull. Okay? Since it's the hardest, we're going to get it out of the way right at first. Your cranial bones are all flat bones permanently fused by sutures, which we're going to learn the names of our sutures. The suture is the joint holding the bones together. The purpose of your cranium all of those bones is to protect your brain and to provide a place for your muscles to attach. Which, why I even mention muscles right now? Because that's where we're going after we finish with bones. We're going to start learning the name of every, not every, of most of the muscles in your body, where they're located, and all that fun stuff. The facial bones are mainly irregular bones. Your facial bones are all really funny shaped. A lot of them have little holes and projections and different odd angles sticking out because there's lots of stuff going on in your face. In your face you have your eyes, so the nerves running from your eye has to go through those bones. In your nose you have your sense of smell, so you have all those nerves that have to run through. Okay? All of the bones around the mouth have to have special types of joints to hold your teeth in place. So it's just a, a big complex area that we have to learn all of them. Okay? Here's our list of our cranial bones. Okay? So by the time we're finished with this today, what you should be able to do is know where all these are located and not just be able to point to it on a picture. You should be able to describe it in words. So, so that should be your goal as you're studying. So on a test, you shouldn't only be able to look at a picture of a skull and point and say frontal bone, parietal bone. You should also be able to answer a multiple choice question like the bone located um, the bone that makes up the forehead is the frontal bone. Okay, so that's what I mean by a, a by word description of it as well as being able to point to a picture. Okay? So first thing we're going to do, we're going to go find all of these on the skull. Okay? Pretty sure I said this in lab, but I'm going to say it again. The easy way to do it is to learn the colored picture and then learn a true white picture of the skull, meaning a picture of just what the bone actually looks like. Okay. When you see the colors, it's much easier because all the little bones are separated. Right? When you saw the skulls in lab, it's not sometimes those sutures are hard to see, right? Okay. All right. So as I go through these, y'all help me out. What bone is this? Frontal. One of the most commonly missed things about the frontal bone is people don't realize the frontal bone actually goes in to form part of the eye socket. Okay? And the way you can remember that is if you touch right here on your top of your eye socket, you can feel how the bone curves under. Okay? So your frontal bone goes from about the normal hairline. Okay? Some of you have different hairlines than others, but the normal hairline, and it goes down and kind of curls underneath into the eye socket. Okay? There's a couple little spots on it that we talk about, and the, the main one I want you to be able to identify is called the supraorbital foramen, and that is a nerve that runs into that area, and we're gonna, that's what that hole is for, and we're going to talk a little bit more about what that nerve is for 
later when we get to muscles. Anytime you see a hole in bone, it's going to be called a foramen or foramen. You can call it whatever you want. I don't care. It means the same thing. Okay? That's what foramen means. That is going to be a hole for a nerve or some sort of blood vessel to flow through. Okay? Behind the frontal bone, connected by a suture, you have two parietal bones. There's one on each side of your head. Okay? What connects those two parietal bones to the frontal bone is called the coronal suture. So the coronal suture is the one that runs this direction, connects frontal to parietal. The two parietal bones are connected by a suture that runs down the center of the head. And that one is called, you may know, sagittal suture, because that's the sagittal section of the body. Very good. Okay. From this view, the only other one we can really see a little is we can see the sphenoid bone. And the sphenoid is this one that's hot pink. The sphenoid bone is actually running through underneath. It's behind your eyeballs, and it's like if someone put an arrow through your head. It's back behind. The only part of it you can touch from the outside is if you touch your temples. You're touching a little bit of the sphenoid bone. So this is sphenoid right here in the temple and also in the back of the eye socket. The sphenoid bone is separated by the superior orbital fissure. A fissure is a, a big slit opening in bone. And this is where the nerves from the eye go back into the brain. Okay? So now if we flip to a different view, the side view, we can still see the frontal and see how it wraps underneath in the eye socket. We can see the parietal. We can see the sphenoid. Now we can also see this bone. This is the temporal bone. The temporal bone is a really funny shaped bone. It has this big zygomatic arch, which is the part that arches over and connects to one of the facial bones, the zygomatic bone we're going to talk about. It also has some structures right down here. It has the external acoustic metis. A metis is an opening that doesn't have something like a nerve running through it. That external acoustic metis is if you stick your finger in your ear. You're sticking your finger into your acoustic metis is where you're going. Okay? These two little projections down here, the really dainty one that's pointy is called the styloid process. The blunt one behind it is called the mastoid process. Those pieces of the bone that are sticking out, they're there for muscle to attach. And you have a really big muscle called your sternocleidomastoid muscle. We'll learn a little later. It connects to that mastoid and that styloid process, comes down around your neck, and allows you to do all of these nice movements with your head. So that's what you have those blunt protrusions for. Okay? One of the easiest bones to identify because it's so funny shaped. The temporal bone is connected to the parietal bone by the squamous or sometimes called squamosal suture, but it's squamous. Okay? All the way in the back, we can see a little bit of the occipital bone, which is connected to the others by the lamboid or lamboidal suture. Okay. If we go one more, I'm come back. Go to the back view. This is the occipital bone. Okay. Has all of these little ridges on the back. That is where all of the muscles on the back of your neck come up and attach to the back of your skull. So you can nod your head yes and no, all that good stuff. Okay? Does everybody see the location of those? What you have in your notes also is kind of what I've been saying as I went through. It's the word description of all of the bones. Okay? So you describe it in words. What is the frontal bone? It's your forehead. It's also a portion of your eye socket. Okay? One thing you may not know is that your frontal bone is, is the location for one of the largest sinuses you have in your body. Does so anybody know what a sinus is? It's a cavity in your bone. What's inside of it? Air. It's an air-filled cavity inside of your bones. The only places you have sinuses, air-filled cavities in your bones, is in your skull. Why do we need air in our skull? Oh. I air like outside the room. What am I doing with my skull right now? Holding it up, right? I'm not letting it just slop all over. So I'm just simply trying to make my head lighter. Why do you put air in a balloon? 
We're in a flow, right? So makes your head a little lighter if you put some air in it. When you get a sinus infection, that means you got something besides air hanging out in there. You get some drainage and things like that. Okay? We went over the sutures, but they're written here for you. So describe the occipital bone for me. It's the bone that forms the back portion of your head or your cranium. Okay? Where we'll be going next after this, talking about the vertebrae, your occipital bone is also the place where your vertebrae, your very first one, is going to attach. And if we flip it over, our last view of the skull to see all these bones, okay, this dark brown bone, that is the occipital bone. Okay? This picture, they've taken the bottom jaw off so you can see it better, and the person is leaning all the way back so that you're looking up at the bottom of the skull. Okay? This giant hole right here in the occipital bone is called the foramen magnum. It's a foramen, so it's a hole in the bone. What goes through there? Spinal cord. These little occipital condyles, that's where the first vertebrae, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes, attaches. And so the spinal cord comes out of that hole and goes down through the vertebrae. I okay. have an MRI I'm going to get and show you guys too. It's really cool to see all of this right, in real life instead of just in the pictures in your book. Okay. So from this view, can you tell me what these side bones are right here? Temporal. Why is that temporal? So think about it. That's the side, right? And if I lean up, it's still on the sides. I'm just looking at it from a different view. The other way I could still tell that was the temporal bone is all of the crazy pieces, right? There's the styloid process, mastoid process, zygomatic arch, all of those pieces. It's just a funny looking bone. Okay? Up here, the hot pink bone, that is the sphenoid bone. It's what we call the bat shaped bone. You guys see that it looks like bat wings? Kind of looks like a bat with the wings hanging out on the side. Okay. You only get to see the bat wing shape if you're looking at it from this view. You can't really see it from the other view. Okay. I just thought about it. I skipped one when we were looking at the front picture. Sorry, not intentionally. You don't have to keep flipping. Just pay attention. The one I skipped was the ethmoid bone, which was right here. Okay. Ethmoid bone is a little bit more towards the nose. You have sphenoid bone. You come a little further in, there's sphenoid, then you have ethmoid. No, not the green, it's orange. The green is lacrimal bone. The orange is the ethmoid bone. It's hard to see over here because it's shadowed out, but it's right here. That is part of it coming down the middle of the nose. And we're going to look at the nose in a lot of detail here in just a second. Okay, I just forgot to point that one out right there. Okay? As I said, the sphenoid bone, that's our bat-shaped bone. The sphenoid bone is also a special bone because it's the only keystone bone of the cranium. A keystone bone is a bone that articulates with all of the other bones of the same type, meaning that sphenoid bone, it's kind of the last puzzle piece. It's the only bone out of all those in the cranium we just talked about that touches every other one. Does that make sense? Okay. Your frontal bone touches your parietals, and it touches your sphenoid and, and partially your ethmoid. But does your frontal bone touch your occipital bone? Of course not. They're too far away. But that sphenoid bone is right in the middle, so it's a keystone bone. It's touching all of them. You took the keystone bone out, wouldn't be able to hold everything as tightly in place. Okay. Ethmoid bone, not extremely amazing, but we're going to see the ethmoid bone does pop up in the eye orbit as well as in the nasal cavity. And we're going to look at both of those here in just a second. Okay? So, is that better? Those of you that are in lab and you looked at it last week, it gets a little easier every time you hear it, right? Every time you point to them. Okay, that's the goal. All right, so now we're ready to look at the facial bones. There's a lot more facial bones than there are cranial bones. And some of the facial bones get little tiny. So you got to... The easiest way for me to learn my facial bones is to kind of find me a point of origin. And I usually start with the center of the nose because that's the easiest for me. And then I kind of learn them in order, coming out towards the ear. As I go more lateral on the face, I just memorize them in order. And I've seen students do this because when I get their test back, they've written letters on their test. And it's usually an N, then an L, then an S, excuse me, then an E, then an S. And what they're doing is writing the 
first letter of the bones in order in the way they learned them. So when they get their test, they don't have to remember it. They can go back and look. Okay. So let's look at all of these. I'm going to flip back to the big skull picture. I didn't want you printing stuff out over and over and over again to point all these out, and then I'll come back and show you, go through the words with you. Okay? And what I'm meaning by this is I'm going to learn that since this is the area that makes my nose, that's my nasal bone. So if I'm memorizing this in my weird way, I'm going to say, okay, I always start with a nasal in the middle. Then as I go further out in either direction, the next one I see is the maxilla. So I'm going to write an M, so nasal, maxilla. Then the next one I see, this little green bone right here, that's the one that your tear duct is in. That's called your lacrimal bone. So now I write my L. Then after that, I see two of those cranial bones before I get to another facial bone. So I would have an ethmoid bone, then a sphenoid bone. Wow, that's an E. That's a crazy looking E. Okay. Then after the sphenoid, I get to my most outside facial bone. That forms your cheekbone. That is the zygomatic bone. Okay. So if this were me taking a test on bones, as soon as I got my test, I would write down N-M-L-E-S-Z. And then when it came time to label pictures or something like that, all I'd have to do is look at it and I could orient myself. If that doesn't help you, you don't have to learn it that way. That was just always the way I learned it because you are going to be expected, I'll show you the blown up pictures in a minute, to name the bones that are part of the eye socket, bones that are part of the nasal cavity. And to me, it's just easier to memorize some letters. That's just my opinion. Nasal, nasal, maxilla, lacrimal, ethmoid, sphenoid, zygomatic. Okay. It's this, it goes this, if you go the other way, it's the same. You just do M L E S Z. But again, that's just my way. If you don't like it my way, don't do it my way. If you come up with a better way, feel free to share. The other bones you can see a little bit inside of this pitiful looking nasal cavity we have in this picture. The vomer is what we call a plow shaped bone. Most of you probably don't know what a plow is because we don't really use plows like this anymore. We're talking about the plow that the, used to hook to the cow and he would, you know, pull. And that's what we mean by a plow shaped bone. Um, this, I said, went over the maxilla already. Lower jaw is the mandible, okay? The mandible has a few structures in it. There's the mandibular symphysis, which is the fusion of the two bones, but they're permanently fused, no suture. And then you have mental foramen. Why are these called mental? On the chin, and the chin is the mental region of the body, right? Okay, good. So side view, you can still see them. Learn them the same way. Nasal, maxilla, lacrimal, ethmoid. Can't see the sphenoid because it goes down in. Then you can see zygomatic. Okay. So let's go back and see if we can describe them in words, which is where we were in the notes. Okay. What would you tell me is special about the mandible? It's your jaw, lower jaw. It's hinged. What does that mean? It can move, right? What about, can you move your zygomatic bone? I hope not. Something's wrong, right? If you can bend any of, any of those other bones in a weird way, something bad is wrong. Okay? The only freely movable joint you have in your face and your cranium is that mandible. And it can move a lot. It can actually even pop out of socket. And some people do that every time they open their mouth. I do that. It freaks the dentist out every time I go to the dentist. When I open my mouth, that jaw pops where it's not supposed to and it'll pop back into place. Okay? All right, y'all missed one of the easy ones. What else is special about this bone? It's got teeth in it, right? And that may seem so obvious that some people miss it, but that helps you a lot when you're looking at a real skull and you're trying to identify bones. If it's got teeth in it, it's got to be one of two bones, the mandible, the lower jaw, or the maxilla, the upper jaw, okay? okay? It is the strongest jaw, strongest jaw, it is the strongest bone in the face, I've never really been hit in the face very hard. I guess I'm just such a sweet person. I ever wanted to punch me in the face. But I would assume that even if it is the strongest bone in the face, 
it's not, it's still going to be easier to damage and break than some of the other bones in our body. So it's the strongest bone in the face, but not one of the strongest bones in the body. The hit, oh, yeah, well, I guess that makes sense. That's true. If you got hit in it, it's not going to shatter the bone. It's just going to dislocate it. Whew. Okay. Glad I've never been hit in the face. All right. So maxilla. We already went over one special thing about the maxilla. It has teeth, right? The other special thing about the maxilla is it is a keystone bone. And what does that mean again? Touches all the other. So what are we talking about right now? Facial bones, right? So this is the keystone bone that touches all the other facial bones. It touches the mandible through the teeth. So if you didn't have your teeth, then it would come closer to touching. So that's why I say it would really touch the mandible. So what's the difference between sphenoid and maxilla? The sphenoid is the keystone bone of the cranium. Good. The maxilla is the keystone bone of the face. Holds everything together. The sphenoid is the keystone bone of the cranium. The maxilla is the keystone bone of the face. Okay. Very good. You guys are doing good. So how would you describe the zygomatic bone to me? Cheekbones, right? Is it true that some people have bigger cheekbones than others? Not really. They're just kind of shifted in a different place. The bone's not really any bigger. Some people have more fat on their face than others. If you're blessed like me with big fat cheeks that no one really wants, uh, you don't necessarily see that zygomatic bone. You've got a nice layer of fat on top of it. Some people, some cultures just have, they're just shaped a little different. They're a little more pronounced, not really any bigger. They're just more pronounced and there's not as much fat surrounding them. Okay? But we all pretty much have about the same size cheekbone. Okay? Nasal bones, not a whole lot special we can say. They're just going to form the center of the nose. Lacrimal bones form the inside medial wall of the orbits. That is where your tear ducts drain through. And there's something called the lacrimal sac inside of that bone. And that's where your tears are produced and some of your um, certain types of antibodies are stored there, things like that. Okay. Now, um, oh, I forgot to go over palatine bones. But we said the vomer, that was that plow-shaped bone in the bottom of the nose. I missed the palatine bone. We need to go back to the underside of the skull for me to show you the palatine bone. What does palatine sound like? Palate. And we all know that our palate is the roof of our mouth, right? If you feel with your tongue the roof of your mouth, first you feel a really hard place. If you go far enough back with your tongue, it gets softer, right? Everybody doing that? That's what I'm talking about? Okay. The very first part underneath that forms the palate is what bone? Maxilla. How do I know this is the maxilla and not the palatine? Because it has teeth. Okay, so that's your key. So first of all, this has got to be maxilla still because there's teeth right there. Behind the maxilla is the palatine bone. Okay, and you have the little palatine foramens, transverse palatine suture holding it in place. Where your palate gets soft, that's the soft palate, which is just a little piece of tissue hanging off the back, back there. And that's a little flap that goes up and down when you swallow. So when you swallow food and stuff, doesn't, liquid doesn't go up your nose, it goes down your throat. I mean, you... Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's just coming out. Mm -hmm. No. The two holes are going up into the top of the skull. Mm -hmm. Not really. Sort of, but not really. Not directly. It's a hard question to answer. All right. So how are we feeling about the skull? Good. We know our part. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can. Okay. That's something that I didn't make you memorize out of Chapter 6 because I hate memorization. I feel like it's better to use words to learn what they mean. If you go back to Chapter 6, there's about four tables with things like foramen, projection, metus, ramus. Those are words that they use, and it all means a certain type of projection or impression of a bone. 
So a projection is a large extension of a bone. A ramus is a curved extension of the bone. The foramen is a hole in a bone. And so we just use different terms to describe what type of little piece is sticking out of the bone. You have to know all the ones that I've went over. Yes. Now, if you notice on here, see how there's a big white line running through here? And if you guys are following along me in your book, why is there big white lines on here? Because there's a whole lot more stuff labeled than what I have labeled. If I have it labeled, I consider it to be something important that you need to be familiar with. I took out as much as I possibly could to leave enough detail for it to all make sense and go together. Okay? So those of you that think I'm being mean and making you memorize a bunch of stuff, I actually took a lot out, whether you believe it or not. Okay, so we are finished talking about the face in just that, in the cranium as a whole. Okay, so now let's just blow up a few portions of the face. Okay, first off, let's blow up the orbit. You need to be able to list all of the bones that make up the eye socket. Okay, because why? Because that's a pretty important place where it all comes together. All right, so tell me what these bones are. Say, Emily, what's this? Frontal. No, that's not the nasal. Maxilla. This is the nasal. Do you think the nasal bone forms part of the eye socket? No, that doesn't make any sense, right? The eye socket doesn't start till you get on the side of the nose. Okay, so we've got frontal, maxilla. What's this? Lacrimal. Ethmoid, pink, sphenoid, and blue. Zygomatic. Good. See, here's the maxilla too. That's another reason it's part of the eye socket. Okay. So that's what forms our eye socket. So is the eye socket formed from cranial bones, facial bones, or a mixture? A mixture. Good. Okay. The next big one is the nasal cavity. And I listed the bones for you that form the nasal cavity. Because when you look at pictures, sometimes it's a little, I don't know, it's a little hard for you to tell, okay? But we've got the ethmoid, palatine, maxilla, and the nasal concha. Which a long time ago, the nasal concha were just part of the vomer and the ethmoid bone. And now they have a nice special little name of their own. So we'll go by the way your textbook does it, and we'll call them the nasal concha, okay? So what's going on in this picture right here? This is mid-sagittal section of the head, right? Meaning I've cut the head right here down the middle between the eyes, and you're looking at the side of it, okay? So you would have, this is one side of the nasal cavity, and you'd have another one that matched it on the other side to actually form the nose, right? Everybody understands that? Okay, so the bones we can see, this is the maxilla, right? Okay, next is the inferior nasal concha, okay? And if we go a little further up, this is the ethmoid bone, okay? and then the nasal bone is just the one in the front. But the actual nasal cavity is formed mainly by these guys right here. Maxilla, inferior nasal concha, and of course the vomer is down there too, okay? and ethmoid bone. Okay? Why can't you see the vomer? Because it's kind of hidden by the concha. There's another picture, goes a little deeper, and now you can see maxilla, vomer, okay, ethmoid, and then now this one actually has a nose sticking off, so it's showing you where the cartilage would attach, right? If we're just looking at bone, it don't look like this. We all kind of got the Michael Jackson nose thing going on, okay, all that missing, okay? Makes sense? This is one of the hardest pictures for people to it, kind of orient themselves with, okay? Now, while you're looking at these, I want you to notice a couple things. So here's that frontal sinus we were talking about, the air-filled holes in the frontal bone. Okay, see this right here? This is a giant hole filled with a cavity filled with air in the sphenoid bone. So you have another sinus way in the back behind your eyes and down into your nose. Can't see it in this picture or this picture, but portion of this ethmoid bone right here also has a sinus. And if we go a little further, even though it's not showing you the bones, you can see your other sinus is right here in your maxilla. Okay? 
How many of you get sinus pressure and sinus headaches? Where does it hurt? So some of you say behind your eyes, some of you say right here, right? Mine usually gets me right here, right around my eyebrows, right? So now look at that picture. Does that make sense why you have sinus pressure where you do? Because when you get a sinus infection, you've got some pressure built up because you've got something besides air. Okay, and I'm making it real simple, but you've got something besides air inside of those sinuses. Now when you're healthy, those sinuses are doing something really good for us. They're filled with air. They're making our head light. They, and they actually have a lot even to do with the way our voice sounds and things like that. That's why when you get a real bad sinus infection, your voice can change some. But when we get sick and we get something else inside of those sinuses, we aren't real happy people. But for the most part, they're good for us. Okay? Um, I think I've asked on a test before which one houses the largest, and everyone would argue with me. Well, this picture makes it look like these are bigger. Okay? Well, the biggest is actually in the maxilla, but I'm not going to ask you that. Okay? I don't feel like arguing with you. Okay? All right, so let's get out of the skull. Let's keep going a little bit further down the axial skeleton. So we have this bone that kind of hangs out by itself in the grouping, and it's called the hyoid bone. The reason we don't know where to put it is because it's the only bone in your body that doesn't articulate with another bone. That means it's a bone that does not connect by a joint and attach to another bone. Your hyoid bone sits right down here in your neck. Now, you're probably not going to be able to feel it because it is surrounded by muscles all the way around. Your hyoid bone is connected to all the muscles that come up and connect to your tongue. So when you swallow, the muscles will pull the hyoid bone up and then pull the hyoid bone down. And that's what helps you swallow and get the food down your throat. Okay? Now, a lot of people like to teach that this looks like a rudimentary mandible, and that could link it to evolution of this is um, an evolutionary trend of a, a different type of lower jaw. I think that's just some people reaching because they wanted to write a book. Okay? For purposes of this class, I just want you to know we got this bone deep down buried in our neck called the hyoid bone, and it helps us get our food down, helps us swallow. Okay? We'll see this again in chapter 10 when we start learning our muscles. We're going to learn all the muscles that are attached to this bone. So you need to know where it is. Okay? So now we're ready to go and talk about the vertebral column. So what's the purpose of your vertebral column, all your vertebrae? Protect your spinal cord. Good. That's one function. What else? To support your body to stand in an upright position. Good. What else? One other one. Flexibility. I guess, yeah, I guess that is a pretty good one. It does provide flexibility. If they were huge, we wouldn't be able to bend like we can. I can think of one other one. Weight. It's a weight bearing. Okay. It's a weight bearing structure because your vertebrae holds all the weight from your thoracic cage and your skull and parts of your arm and it holds ours upright. Okay, so that means our vertebrae are holding quite a bit of pressure. Now, in addition to that, we also have what type of cartilage stuck between our vertebrae? Fibrocartilage. We got that in there, too, to help us with some of the shock and the pressure of all the weight. Okay? All right. We're going to have several types. We have cervical vertebrae. We have thoracic vertebrae, lumbar vertebrae. And then down towards the bottom, they fuse together, and we form something called the sacrum and the coccyx. Okay. Now, I don't ever ask questions like, how many cervical vertebrae are there? I don't see any point in memorizing numbers. Okay. What I want you to be able to do is I want you to be able to look at them and tell which type of vertebrae it is. So if I show you a picture of a vertebrae, you can tell me that's cervical or that's thoracic, that's lumbar. And also, I want you to be able to tell me the parts. Okay. So the cervical, they're going to form the vertebrae in our neck. It starts with the atlas and the axis. That's the name of the first two. They look funny. We're going to look at them in just a second. We didn't look at them in lab yet. We're going to look at them in just a second. Okay. Looking at these cervical vertebrae, while they're connected together, how do they look different than the other guys? They're smaller. They're more compact. Good. They're actually a little closer together. 
there's not quite as much fibrocartilage stuck in between those as there are some of the other ones. What do you think the cervical vertebrae's job would be? It holds, it holds your head, gives your head flexibility, right? Is, is your cervical area holding as much weight as your lumbar area? No, so they don't have to be quite as big, and they can compact together so we can wiggle our head around. Okay? The next vertebrae are the thoracic, and they have a very important job. They're right here. What connects to my thoracic vertebrae? My ribs, and that's the main job of the thoracic vertebrae. And I already went over it a little bit, but now we have lumbar vertebrae, and how do they look? They have those massive body parts, right, body regions. Why do they need to be so big? They hold the most weight, okay? And then down here, this is where your butt would be, right? It's where your hip bone connects. This is the sacrum. I think this thing looks like, you guys ever seen Star Trek? The guy that has the wrinkly forehead, he's a Klingon, is that what he is? I'm not a big fan, but the guy that's a Klingon, looks like he's got a sacrum sitting on his forehead, okay? And then the thing at the bottom, this is your butt bone. So I have a general knowledge question for you. Does your spinal cord go all the way down into your butt bone? Where does your spinal cord stop? At the sacrum? At the lumbar? See, I think it stops right here. No, it stops way up here. At about your third lumbar vertebrae is where your spinal cord ends. And it becomes something called the caudal equina, and it just splits out and becomes nerves and comes out and goes down your legs. That's why you ever met somebody that has a slip disc way down here in their back? Well, if that disc had slipped all the way forward in their spinal cord in there, they'd be paralyzed, right? That's why those discs can shift around when you get older and it doesn't paralyze you. Because your spinal cord does not go all the way down. It stops about right here. Okay? See, you learned something today. All right? Okay? All right, so structure of a vertebrae. It's the pieces are written there. We're going to come to a picture and look at it. Okay? The hole that runs down the center, that's called the vertebral foramen. And we just went over it. What, flows th what goes through there? Spinal cord. Okay? Now, we're kind of going through this with my grandmother, so it makes me think of it to share with you because I realized that my grandmother and my mother and most of them didn't really understand what the neurologist was telling them. When you look at this, you should understand that your spinal cord only sits about fills up about this much of the space in the center. Does anybody know what's outside of that? Fluid. Spinal fluid. Okay. A lot of times as people get older, and this is what's happening to my grandmother, the bones will calcify and the bone protrudes in and so you have no room for the spinal fluid and the bone is pushing on the spinal cord. And if you damage, if you pop your neck or get in a car accident or something, it can actually cause permanent damage to your spinal cord because you don't have that fluid protection. Okay? That's why if anybody's ever been in a wreck and it didn't paralyze you, it doesn't mean your spinal cord, your, excuse me, your vertebral column didn't pop or move real hard one way or another, but you got that spinal fluid protecting your cord wrapped around it. Okay? I'm sorry, I know back to bones, but I thought you may find it causes what? It's mainly just age. As, as people age, they get different bone disorders. Not really. Uh, my grandmother's 76. So, I mean, she's, you know, her body's been working for her for a long time. So, with age, that ex excess calcification just kind of happens. Not a whole lot. If she had told us about it before it started getting to the point that it was hurting as bad as she is now, then there are things they can do. They can go in and give injections make the fluid build back up. They can actually even go in and remove some of that bone, but most of your old people aren't going to tell you something's wrong until they're in extreme pain. And now she has no spinal fluid. It's in her neck. And it's just bone directly rubbing on spinal cord. And I'll bring her MRI and show you guys. It's really interesting. Okay? So that's the vertebral foramen. The big part right here, that's called the body. Okay? Question of the day. Which way is that facing? The body. Is it towards the belly or towards the back? Towards the belly. Feel of your back. What do you feel right there? Different. Oh, come on. <laughs> well, then bend over and feel. You feel the little pokey things? Y'all feel those, right? Those pokey things are the spinous processes. So that's how you can remember to 
That's how you can remember which way this goes. Tell you a funny story. The summer that I was teaching AMP1, I always get up here and I'm pointing the bones and everything, and I was a big pregnant. I was like almost eight months pregnant by the time we got to bones. And I said, okay, so you know these ribs you can feel right here, and I kind of felt, and I thought, oh, my God, I can't feel my ribs anymore. And I realized it was just so huge being pregnant. I couldn't feel my ribs. It was a very depressing day. So, anyway, if you've been over, you can feel the little pokey things in your back. That is your spinous process sticking out the back. Okay? The spinous process also points down. It's especially important in lab when you're orienting yourself with the real ones. You need to be able to point that spinous process down. Okay? So this is the back or posterior. So these things poking out to the sides, those are the transverse processes. Okay? We also have some superior articulate processes and inferior articulate processes. So if we lay this the correct way, I'll come back to these pictures, I promise. So if we lay it this way, the piece on top is the superior process. The piece on bottom is the inferior process. Make sense? Okay. So let's look specifically at the cervical vertebrae. Okay. And I said it goes from 1 to 7. Number 1 and number 2 are the only ones you need to specifically know as different. They are the atlas and the axis. Okay? Atlas C1 is named by Atlas. He's one of the gods. I can't remember if he's Greek or Roman. But Atlas is supposedly the god that holds up the earth, if you have ever studied any mythology. So that's why he's named Atlas. The, the purpose of your Atlas is to hold your skull. Okay? The second C2 is called Axis because it allows you to rotate your head along the axis. Okay, so if we look at them, okay, so that's just the generic one. We'll come back to it. I thought I had, yeah. Here is the atlas, okay. To me, it kind of looks like, like a shark jaw. Can you guys see that? It just kind of looks like a shark jaw. It is missing the body and the spinous process. Okay, remember, you guys kind of remember in your head the generic one we just looked at. What was the body? the big round part, right? It came towards the belly. Okay? You can see when we look at the atlas, it doesn't have anything like that. It's just got these big facets. Think all the way back to when we went over the skull. We had the occipital condyles, right? Those smooth little pieces at the bottom of the skull. Those sit directly into here, into the atlas. Okay? Underneath the atlas is the axis. And to me, it kind of looks like an arrowhead. It's just much more narrow. Why does it need to be narrow? So we can take our head and we can rotate it. Okay? If it was gigantic, we would only be able to move our head so much in one direction or another. So it's smaller vertebrae so we can move our head around a lot. These two are unique vertebrae to humans and some of your higher mammals. As you get down to your lower mammals, their atlas and axis looks different. And that should make sense, right? What can an owl do? which he's not, he's not a mammal, but he can turn his head all the way around, right? It's because his cervical vertebrae are different at the top than ours are. This is strictly us we're talking about. Mm -hmm. You guys see the way? Say that again. The vertebrae are irregular bones. Yes, ma'am. That's not a stupid question. That's probably more related to what we're talking about than what I'm talking about. Okay? All right, so now let's go back to our generic cervical vertebrae. Okay? Can you find the body? Easily, right? Can you find the vertebral foramen? Right, big hole in the middle. Spinous process is opposite. Now here's the hard part. Where's the transverse process? Doesn't have a big old piece sticking out each side, right? It's got little short, blunt transverse processes that do this. Wrap right back around, and what do I have? I have a hole in them. Okay? And that, so this is the transverse process. It has the transverse foramen in each side. That is your big key to knowing you're looking at a cervical vertebrae. If you see the little pieces sticking out to the side and there's little holes in it, then it's cervical. The only one that has transverse foramen. Okay? <coughs> Excuse me. When you see them linked together, okay, here's transverse processes. These are the spinous processes out the back. Okay? So you're kind of looking at it in this direction. Okay, it's almost back of it facing you. Okay? What I want you to see is so here's the top, here's that atlas, 
shaped completely different, right? Like a big shark's jaw. Underneath it, you can't see, is the axis. Really small little vertebrae that sits underneath, so we can rotate everything around. And then we have five of these normal, generic cervical vertebrae underneath, sitting nice and tight on top of each other. Okay. All right. So now let's look at thoracic. So if I am the demonstration, if this is cervical, right, this is thoracic. Transverse processes go up. Everybody see the difference? So cervical transverse processes were out to the side with little holes in them. Thoracic, the transverse processes go up. Okay? So when we look at them, do you see what I mean by up? Right? They are much more pointy, and they're sticking more in the direction of your spinous process. What do you think I have these little facets in my transverse processes for? Ribs. Okay. Remember what we said? Right here in my thoracic vertebrae, that rib's got to come out. When we look at ribs, probably next week, okay, you'll see the rib sits perfectly inside that little indention right there. Very good. And if we look at it in proper orientation, the way it is in the body, you can see one of your big key features, another big key feature, See how that spinous process is really long and it pokes straight down? Okay, it's another one of your big key features. And when you see them sitting on top of each other, you can see how that pokes way down when they articulate with each other. Now your textbook is going to tell you that the way you can tell it's thoracic is it looks like a giraffe. Does everybody see the giraffe? Okay, that's because it's in a textbook and they drew it. So, yeah, it does look like a giraffe. In real life, they don't all always look like perfect giraffes. So it's better to learn spinous processes are really pointy, you know, vertebral forming, perfect circle, things like that. Okay. Okay, last one, lumbar vertebrae. This is the lumbar vertebrae. So let me do my weird example. So this was cervical, right? This was thoracic. Here's lumbar. Can I see the difference? Okay. Cervical. Thoracic, lumbar. Okay. Now I know that's dumb, but if it helps you remember, that's all that matters to me. So let's look at the picture and describe it. What's the body look like on this lumbar vertebrae? This big circle, right? Okay. What does the vertebral foramen look like that makes it different? It's more triangle shaped. It's smushed down, right? What do the transverse processes look like that are different? They're straight out and plane wings. Good, right? They're they're not all pointy and big. They're kind of blunted down and they're a little stumpy. Okay? Out to the side, you don't no longer have that little pointy spinous process bending way down here, right? It's a lot shorter and more blunt of a process. It's wider. I'm not sure why, and I was thinking, God, I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> yes, it is wider. <laughs> okay? When they're sitting on top of each other, oh, God, it left me. This is supposed to be an animal. Moose, thank you. That's what your textbook will tell you this is, is a moose. But you can see, obviously, I couldn't even remember. I don't think that's a good way to remember them. But this is supposed to look like a moose. Okay. All right. Last two, the sacrum and the coccyx. Okay, we go to the picture. Okay. Here's the anterior view of the sacrum, so that's towards the belly. This is what the sacrum looks like from behind. You guys see how it looks like a Klingon forehead? You know what I'm talking about? Looks like his forehead? Like a stingray. It does look like a few species of stingrays, if some of them, right? Down here, the coccyx is the butt bone made of several little pieces. Anybody ever broke their butt bone in here? Usually have one, okay? Yeah, I broke my butt bone. It is not fun. It sucks, right? You would never think that some little bone hidden in there would hurt so bad, but it does. It was when I was young, though, so I guess it's better than being old and happening. Okay? Oh, yeah. All your, most of your bones can naturally fuse back together. It depends on how you break it, okay? Most people don't really break their coccyx completely in half. Most people just bend it or bruise it and... It's broken. I don't remember. I was a little kid. Okay. All right. Let's see what time is it. Okay. Let's go ahead and do thoracic cage today. Let's finish with the axial skeleton. All right. Your thoracic cage is made up of your sternum, which is your chest or breastplate, your ribs, okay, as well as 
Some of the vertebrae do make up your thoracic cage, but we've already talked about those. Okay? Your thoracic cage, I'm going to go to the picture. You guys can read later. Okay? Your thoracic cage is there to protect your thoracic cavity. What's inside of your thoracic cavity? Lungs and your heart, right? So that's why you have your vertebrae, protecting all those essential organs inside of your thoracic cavity. The sternum is a flat bone made up of, was, it's made up of three parts. Two parts are flat bone. The top right here is called the manubrium. Right here, this is called the body. A little piece of hyaline cartilage hanging out the bottom is called the xiphoid process. Okay. Our ribs connect from the one portion or the other of the sternum, go around back, and connect to a thoracic vertebrae. You have three different types of ribs. You have true ribs, false ribs, and floating ribs. Floating ribs are technically a type of false rib, as some of you pointed out in lab, but we're going to just talk about them as three separate types. Okay? So follow my cursor. This is a true rib. It goes all the way back there from a vertebrae, wraps around, and touches the sternum. Okay? Here's the next one. From a vertebrae, wraps around, directly touches the sternum. So now I'm going to go down here to a false rib. From the vertebrae, it wraps around and it stops right here. Did it go all the way back to the sternum itself? No. It had to connect through cartilage to get back up here. So that's what makes it false. Everybody see the difference? Okay. These two down here, these are floating ribs. They don't come back and touch anywhere near the sternum. They only have one connection point and that's a thoracic vertebrae. Okay. Do men and women have different amounts of ribs? No. That's something you learned in Bible study. Okay. That's not true. Men and women have the same number of ribs. Okay. Men do have larger ribs than women. So I'm not telling you that your religious beliefs are wrong. I'm telling you they were explained a little bit too literally. Okay, so if you believe that woman was made from a man's rib, then just think of it as he took part of it to make woman. Okay, but oh, there you go. See, so but women today have the same amount of ribs as men. Okay, I don't, I don't like to be I don't like to talk religious in science class, but that's one thing you do clearly need to know. We all have the same number of ribs. Okay, all right. If we look at our rib right here. Okay. Here it is connecting back here. It connects directly to a thoracic vertebrae. This is what we call the head of the rib. Okay. It has a really, st really steep angle, comes down. This is the shaft of the rib, and then connects back through coastal cartilage or hyaline cartilage directly into the sternum. Back here on the neck and head region of the rib, you have a little blunt piece sticking out called a tubercle. That is where we're going to have rib um, muscles attach when we get to chapter 10 and we start learning those muscles. So you'll remember you have that little, little bump on your ribs. Okay? Just another picture showing you where. So here's the head of the rib. Comes up before we have the angle, right? Remember I told you you had that little facet in your thoracic vertebrae for it to hook into nicely? And there you go. You have a nice little hook. There's all your ligaments, and your muscles are going to come up and attach right here, right near this little bump. Okay. So today we went over the axial skeleton. Okay. Do you feel better about it? You've looked at it some in lab. Those of you who haven't looked at it in lab, you're hearing it for the first time. So I'll ask you next time if it is better next time. Okay? But is it starting to starting to mesh? Okay. Don't go anywhere 